Hey everybody, I am back doing some SPSS videos for you today. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover the new version of process. So this is process three, which has some new additions to it. And we're gonna try to do a bunch of different permutations of the options in process, as well as present to you some options to doing this in R, if you would like to learn how to do it in R. So I'm gonna start with simple mediation, which is model one here, or model four in process. And it's one of the more popular options that process has. So it's simple mediation because it includes only one mediator. So we're gonna have some X variable predict Y and also to see if X actually predicts M, which predicts Y. So we're predicting this sort of third variable, which is what mediation is. And we're looking at if the path is redirected from X to Y to X to M to Y. So it's kind of like predicting an order. I've done simple mediation on my channel before. So this time we're gonna throw in some covariates to kind of mix this up. So we're gonna include two extra covariates to show you how that works. In future videos, we're gonna talk about categorical predictors because that's another popular request. Okay, so this is gonna be simple mediation with covariates in process version three. So I pulled this data set from R, it's the MT cars data set. And this example may not show real mediation, but it will show you how to do it. So we have our cylinders in a car that are gonna predict the miles per gallon. But we also know that horsepower is involved here. So we're gonna predict miles per gallon with cylinders as X, but also include maybe a redirect of horsepower because cylinders can lead to horsepower, which can lead to miles per gallon. Well, we know that the weight of the car and the gears of the car also are influencers, so we're gonna include those as covariates. And so that leaves us with four IVs. And so if we were trying to do power for this, power is really tied to the number of independent variables. And a power for mediation can be really tricky because you're really wanting to have that indirect effect be different from zero but you still probably need your R squared or overall prediction for the model to be significant in whatever form that means to you. And so we're just going to use kind of an easy hack for power that kind of anybody can use. And to do that, I'm going to use G power, which is one of my favorite power programs for non R people. And what we'll do is we'll pick that we want to use an F test and linear multiple regression fixed model R squared deviation from zero. What that's gonna allow us to do is use R squared deviation from zero. And that is, uh, we expect something to predict Y. It's either gonna be X is predicting Y originally, and then M is actually the one that really predicts, or X and M together predict. Uh, our CVs we might expect to predict, so something's gonna be predicting Y. So uh, this one works pretty well when I wanna just kind of hack estimate power. I'm gonna move this over, click determine. We're gonna use from correlation coefficient because it's uh, the easiest. So squared multiple correlation or rho here. That's our, our estimated R squared. So let's say we wanna do a medium effect size, so 0.06 for R squared. Um, there are a couple of different rules that you can use here, but I've seen 0.06 the most. Hit calculate and transfer to main. Okay, that's gonna transfer it into Cohen's F squared. Alpha is 0.05, or pick your favorite alpha. Power, most people use 0.8, at least in psych. And we have four predictors, our IV, our M, and our two CVs, because we're doing this on the final model, which is the one we're the most interested in. So four predictors here. If you're on a Mac, the calculate button's hard to find, so just hit enter. If you're on a Windows machine, you can find it pretty easy. And then it says we need 200 people. I don't think we have quite that many cars in this data set, but that would be the required number of people. So I'm gonna cut and paste that into this how-to guide for you to look at later. Now we're gonna pop over to SPSS and work our way through some data screening. If you've watched my channel before, you know I'm really um, into data screening because it's important to look at your data and sort of uh, understand what's happening in the background. So this data screening procedure is from Tobachnik and Fidel. I'm not really gonna explain a lot of the steps I'm doing because I have like six videos on how to do this in SPSS, so if you wanna learn more about why the things that I'm doing, um, be sure to check out one of those videos. So I'm gonna kinda try to keep these a little bit shorter by walking you through these steps so you have a, a guide from start to finish, 
but maybe not explaining it quite so much in detail um, because there are other videos that you can watch if you need some more background on this procedure. So let's start with data accuracy. So here's my data set in SPSS. And there's a lot more data than I really am gonna use here. Um, so we're just gonna start by looking at are the, the data points accurate for the columns I'm interested in. Okay, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go to Analyze, Descriptives, and then Descriptives. Um, we could also use frequencies if we wanted to create um, histograms of each individual one. Let's stick with descriptives here. So miles per gallon, cylinders, horsepower, weight, and gear here. Okay. Under options, it gives you the main ones that you're interested in, but really the range too, so you get the min and the max. Um, and that might be one reason you want frequencies instead of descriptives. All right, so miles per gallon ranges from 10, which seems kind of low, to 34, so that looks about right. Cylinders runs from four to eight. Right. I've only got 32 participants, so I'm way under my sort of required amount here, so hopefully we have a bigger effect size than we think. Um, horsepower here ranges from 52 to 335. I have no idea if that's accurate, but I'm assuming it is. <laughs> Weight from one to five tons, gears from three to five. So we don't have any fancy six gear cars in here. Right. So all of this looks fairly accurate. I will be looking for values that are outside of the range of the expected data or really wild standard deviations that I am familiar with and I know that it should not be that high. Right. So we've checked off accuracy here. Check. Now for missing data, I can already tell I don't have any missing data because it would be uh, down here. It would say which ones were missing. So check and check. Now let's talk about outliers. Since this is a regression analysis, we're gonna use the uh, two strikes you're out rule. And we're gonna look at um, calculating Mahalanobis distance, Cook's values and leverage values for the final model. So we're gonna not use step one or step two in the sort of traditional mediation models, but we're gonna use the last model with all of the variables in it. So I'm gonna go down to analyze. Now I have to do this as regular regression and not use the plugin because the plugin doesn't have this option yet. So regression, linear. Our dependent variable here is we're gonna predict miles per gallon. We're gonna use cylinders, horsepower, weight, and gear because it's our X, M, and two CVs. Uh, under save, we're going to hit all three of these bad boys. And there are even more options to checking for outliers. These are just kind of the big three that you'll see. Continue. That's all we really need to do. But since we're also gonna move on to assumptions, let's go ahead and set that up. So under plots, we're gonna put Z predicted in Y, Z residual in X, histogram and normal probability plots. So this is gonna give us everything that we need to check for outliers and for data screening uh, assumptions. Continue and go. All right, so there's gonna be a lot of output here. Very first thing you wanna do is ignore the output. So we want to come over here and look at our scores for these. So I have to figure out what kind of cutoff score to use for these. So I've got my Mahalanova scores which ones are no good. Uh, and what we wanna do that with, come back over here, is we gotta first figure out a degrees of freedom. Well, degrees of freedom is the number of um, predictor variables, which in this case is four. If you've looked at some of my videos before, sometimes that's the number of variables that goes into the equation, um, but in regression, it's the number of predictor variables. So we gotta find a cutoff score so I'm gonna use a chi-square table. Whoops, I'm gonna misspell chi-square. And no chi-square table's gonna pop up, there it is. So what you wanna do is not do whatever I just did. Sorry about that, I was trying to make it bigger so you could read it. All right, so Adobe hates me. 
how about zoom? Zoom would be nice. Zoom. Okay, ah, here it is. Let's make this bigger. So we have four variables down here and we wanna use P less than 0 0.001 because we want things to be really weird before we start ex excluding them. So we've got 1847 for four degrees of freedom. And we wanna see how many people um, should we exclude. Okay, so let's come over here. I'm gonna sort my Mahalanobis values. So data sort cases. Because on my Mac, control click doesn't always work for the sort option for some reason. So you can also right click on the column and do sort. Okay, I'm gonna put those in descending order because um, it's always positive. Thank you for telling me. Now check this out. So anything over whatever our cutoff score is would be considered an outlier. We said it was 1847. So we don't have any outliers for Mahalanobis. Okay, so no outliers yet. For Cook's values, what I want to do is figure out a Cook's cutoff score. And I listed those criteria here in the document. So we're going to do 4 divided by n, which I said was 32, minus k. What the heck is k? k, remember, is the number of predictors. Okay. So 4 minus 1. Do a little math here on my phone. So 32 minus 4 minus 1 is 27. So 4 divided by 27 is 0.148. It's usually best to go three decimals because these can get, um, these are always small numbers. While I have my handy calculator out, let's go ahead and do leverage as well. So this would be 2 times 4 plus 2 divided by 32. It's 2 times 4 plus 2 divided by 32 is 0.313. So let's go back to SPSS and sort our Cook's values. Still descending. And now I have some values that are over 0.148. So I would wanna mark those people in some way. So we can, um, I've done this a couple of different ways before, but really what we can do is use a column that, um, or a transform. And so we can compute variable here. We'll call them cooks out for cooks outliers. And I'm going to say um, any, let's see here. Oops. Cooks values, what, oh, I hit a button that are greater than 0.148. Okay. Let's hit OK. I hate that it opens the output every single time. So anything greater than 0.148 is now marked with a 1. So that's really handy because now I can filter or sort cases based on them being bigger than this cutoff score. Okay. We didn't have any Mahalanobis outliers. It was pretty easy to see. But if you did, you could use the same procedure. Let's do that last thing one more time for leverage. I'm pretty sure we have some leverage outliers. So let's go leverage out. And we decided that was 0.313. So 0.313. So anything greater than 0.313 is an outlier. And I can also sort those to see those people at the top. So I only have one leverage outlier. So I had two cooks outliers and one leverage outlier. Now the two out of three rule means that if you get two strikes, you're out. So if I had cooks and leverage or cooks and Mahalanobis, etc., I would be considered an outlier. So we could create a total outlier column. Now I don't have any Mahalanobis ones, so easy enough. Add these two together. And it looks to me like I don't have anybody whose two strikes are out. 
But the nice thing about using it and creating these columns is later in life when you're like, what the heck did I do? They're there for you to remember. Um, additionally, you can also use filters. So data, select cases. I could say only use people whose total outlier score is less than two. Now in this case, that will be all cases. Um, but later if I'm trying and when I, if maybe if I had an analysis where I did exclude some outliers, I could remember how many outliers there were and I could use this filter column to filter people. So that's just kind of an easy way if you had like maybe thousands of cases and you wanted to um, uh, run analysis with and without outliers. Okay, so you can turn the filter off and on. Okay. So with our outliers, we don't have any. Now the nice thing about not having any is it means we can look at that output that keeps popping up and going away <laughs> out here for all of our uh, assumptions. So we don't have any outliers here. So we would say, no overall outliers found. Um, and if you want to cite this procedure, I, Mahalo Nobis, I pulled from Tabachnik and Fidel. Cooks and Leverage, I think is also in that book, but mostly uh, Cohen, Cohen, Aiken, and West uh, is a blue regression book. So additivity is really the first assumption. And additivity, remember, is that the there's no multicollinearity. Now, the point of a mediation analysis is actually multicollinearity. So this gets a little tricky, but mainly we're just concerned that it's not too high that the whole thing doesn't run. So to do that, we go to analyze, correlate, bivariate, and we're gonna throw all of our X, our predictor variables in there. So not miles per gallon, because that's why, but cylinders, horsepower, weight, and gear. Now, we do expect these to be correlated because um, you expect X, which in this case um, is cylinders, to predict M, which is horsepower. So I expect them to be correlated. I just want to make sure this isn't like 0.99 or something. You just don't want it too high that the regression analysis won't run. So we are talking about some very highly correlated variables here. Um, but again, we're doing mediation. So mediation is kind of the point is kind of suppression because normally I would not want to include these two variables together in the same analysis because those are so highly correlated. They're just going to kind of cancel each other out. But that's the point of mediation. So mainly here, make sure nothing is perfectly correlated and that will help you troubleshoot any errors about a singular matrix. Okay. So lots of super highly correlated variables. That's what I would expect here. Okay. So moving on. Now for normality, we expect the, um, the error terms to be, uh, residuals to be centered around zero and normally distributed. So let's go back over here. Now that I actually already had run as part of that regression analysis, except it's jumping around. Okay. Um, if you exclude outliers, run that regression analysis again, so you get the histogram without the outliers. Okay. This histogram, we didn't have any outliers, so I'm going to use this one. It is centered over zero, and it's mostly between two and two. It is not perfect. We also have a small sample size. So the larger the sample, the hopefully the better it will approximate normal. Um, with at least 30 people, the central limit theorem kind of kicks in, but bigger samples are always better. Um, here you can see that maybe there's some missing data out here, but it's mostly centered over zero and between two and two. So it looks pretty good. If we scroll down and we want to look at linearity, we mostly want the dots to be on the line. Be forgiving um, because, uh, especially with smaller samples. Uh, so mostly you don't want these to look like S curves or to be like a hammock that you could take a nap in. So mainly we're here just looking kind of that they're close to the line. These look pretty close to me. The last thing we want to do here is um, look at this um, standardized residual uh, scatter plot. So it gives me a residual of the, um, our, a scatter plot of the residuals from the regression. So that's how far off we were at predicting our scores with the standardized predictive residuals. And so you kind of, you want these to make a blob. Okay. With this few dots, it's hard to tell, but you want for homogeneity them to be centered around zero, both directions. So mainly you want the graph to be from two to two on the bottom, two to two on the side, or three to three, and just not like two to six. That would be bad. Okay. So we're mostly centered around zero. 
for homoscedasticity, you want this to be just a blob. Okay, you don't want any triangle shapes. Jokingly call these Dorito chips sometimes, but no triangle shapes, uh, no megaphone shapes where it's small on one end and gets larger on the other. Um, mainly just no issues with like funky shapes. We're not doing so hot because there's data missing here, potentially because there is a, obviously a lower limit for a lot of these variables. Um, when you're talking about cars, kind of some data missing here. I'd say this is mostly okay. Um, there just aren't a whole lot of dots. Okay. So if you draw a circle around the edge of the dots, you just don't want it to make anything, any weird shape. Um, if you Google um, heteroscedasticity, it may take some tries on the spelling, even for me. Um, in SPSS, you'll see a lot of these charts with examples of some bad ones. So I would say all in all, we've done the outliers and we've met our assumptions. So let's try the actual mediation now. And what I'm going to do afterwards, so you don't have to listen to me point and click on a lot of these, is cut and paste these graphs into this document so you can actually open this Word document and follow along. Now for the actual analysis, be sure you've installed the process plugin. There's a um, how-to guide on Hayes' website. I'm going to come down to Analyze, Regression, and then down here to Process. Uh, and I'm going to use version 3 this time. So we're using the newest version available. All right, so this is going to be model four. Um, most of the model numbers appear to me to be the same. Unfortunately, there's no templates uh, for this new version. It's only available with the book. Um, but at least the first six models appear to be the same. I haven't really tested the rest of them yet. So we're going to use model four, which is our simple mediation model. Our x variable is going to, I'm sorry, our y variable is going to be miles per gallon. X variable is going to be cylinders. And mediator is going to be HP, weight, and gear here in covariates. And then let's double check. That's what I said I was actually going to do. Okay. Yes, so cylinders, horsepower, weight, and gears. Great. Okay. Now, um, we can save the bootstrap estimates, but uh, that takes like a lot of space. So I tend to not use that option, I think. Uh, most commonly, 5,000 is pretty common. If your computer runs really slow, you can bump it down to 1,000, just kind of preview it. Um, I'm going to leave mine at 95% confidence, confidence intervals. Okay. Under options over here, we can pick to see the total effect model. That's X predicting Y, which is considered C sometimes. Okay, I can say, um, see if I want to get the effect size for it heteroscedastic consistent inference, you would want to look up your these different versions. There's some explanations of them online and pick which one you like. They're pretty different, so I'm just going to leave that at none because I don't have an opinion. And then this section here is for moderation, which is not what we're doing yet, so we're going to continue. And mostly this is set up for mediation at the start. Hit OK. And then wait. So what I'm going to do is we're going to double click on this, copy it, and then write on it and explain all the pieces of the output here. So we're going to pop over to Word and use Word to keep going. Now, it won't really totally line up perfectly when we copy it, but we'll be able to figure it out. So the first part just reminds you what you put in. So here are, is everything that we entered into the equation. This very first one, so what I always like to do is just sort of figure out which model this is first. So it definitely looks like we've got X predicting, oh, Calibri, uh, or monospaced, I guess. X predicting horsepower. Remember the horsepower is M. So this is X predicting M, which traditionally people call the A path. Okay, because A is an important part of the indirect effect, because the indirect effect is A times B. It's also C minus C prime in some instances, um, but it'll help if you're watching this series, if you can remember that it's A times B, because when we get into uh, serial mediation, it's a moderated mediation, 
Uh, it's always some form of a times b, depending on what you're doing. So we're gonna say that does do cylinders predict horsepower? So we're doing x predicting m. And if I wanted to write this out in APA style, I could say uh, yes, right? So we're looking mainly here at this line. And what I would do is present B. Okay, these are the unstandardized coefficients. Um, and there's a whole long explanation in his book about why those are better. Um, but I would say for every, uh, the B equals here 96. So for every one unit increase in X, we get B unit increases in Y. And then so in this case, for every one unit increase in cylinders, we get, um, uh, 33 increases in horsepower. Okay. We would include uh, degrees of freedom here. So this is tricky. So what are the degrees of freedom? Well, it's always going to be um, the second degrees of freedom here. So that's this one. It doesn't line up because of the way I copied it. But if you do pictures, this will um, copy a little better. But let me go over here. So you can see uh, the second degree of freedom here. Okay. Which is n minus k minus 1. Um, so, or n, yeah, n minus k minus 1 because it's n minus 3 minus 1. Um, and so, it's, but the way I always remember is this is the second degree of freedom for our t value. And that's true for all three of these coefficients. So for cylinders, I got T equals, and if I line it up here, it's this 6.44 or 6.64. Okay. Our P value is less than 0.01. And we could maybe calculate PR squared or something to add an effect size. So yes, our A path is significant. We could also talk about our covariates, which one is significant and one isn't. So for weight here, we would say that the weight doesn't really appear to be predicting horsepower. So it's still T of 28 equals 1.75 equals 0.09. And I'm gonna go three decimals here as suggested by APA. And we could also talk about gear, how gear does appear to be predicting for horsepower. And T is still 28. 4.43 and P is less than 0.001. And so that's how we'd read this. So we're gonna use this COIF column here. COIF stands for B. We're gonna use the T column. Okay. So these three T values, P values. And if you wanna also present um, the confidence interval for the, for the predict coefficient, here's your lower and upper limit for confidence intervals. In this case, it's a 95% confidence interval. So our, our um, A path is significant. So we found X predicting M. Great. Now we're gonna come down here and this is gonna be our full model where it's gonna include B, which is the important one, and C prime. So in this case, we have X predicting Y, right, which is gonna be C prime. So that's cylinders predicting miles per gallon. So I got negative 0.81, oops, sorry. So B here equals don't do it. There we go. Uh, 0 0.81 is negative. Okay. Our T, so our degrees of freedom in this case, is going to be 27 because we have one extra variable in this equation, which is M. So that's where we got 27 for Cooks earlier. Right, so here's our coefficient. Here's our standard error. Here's T here. So it's this negative 1.22 or 23 if I round up. P value is 0.23. Now often you want C prime to not be significant, but that was really the older kind of views on like if C prime was significant, the world was over. Um, now we're not really interested in significance so much, but we're looking at the indirect effect. So the indirect effect is A times B, uh, which tells me if there's a difference between C and C prime. So kind of haven't figured out if mediation has happened yet or not. Uh, we can also look at M predicting Y. This is the B path. M predicting Y with X in the equation. So we're going to say 
the B value here. So not B path, not to be confused with B, the notation for coefficients, right, is our horsepower. So we got negative 0 0.02. Uh, our T value is 27, and this one's not significant either. Now the question is, is it not significant due to a lack of power, or is it not significant because um, it just isn't? 179. And so this is where you would have to um, figure out if you think that this variable is just not predictive, or if you think, well, you know, this is wildly underpowered because I expected um, uh, a certain R square and maybe I'm not hitting it. But if you wanna know R square, it's right here. So we have predicted 84% of the variance. So it's probably likely that this variable just does not predict Y. Okay. Or maybe there's some serial mediation going on here. I could also talk about um, weights and gear one more time. So I'm gonna copy this so you don't have to watch me type for quite so long. And so in this case, weight is actually negative with all these other variables in here. So weight has changed from 17 to negative three. So there's clearly something going on here with the addition, the chain, we're also talking about a different um, dependent variable here. So um, not completely comparable. Not comparable at all, really. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but we're talking about now weight is predicting in this instance uh, miles per gallon and not horsepower. So don't compare those two. I got ahead of myself. So it is significant. So I would say 3.55. Notice I changed my T value to 27 and P equals 0 0.001. And now gear, gear is just not doing us a whole lot of use. It's 0.36. The T value is also 0.36 because our standard error is perfectly one, which is a little unusual. This is And our p-value was equal to 0 0.792. I missed that, 720. Okay. So in the full model, weight is predictive of miles per gallon. So heavier cars get less miles per gallon. And um, gear here is not predictive. Now our total effect model, which we kind of have to ask for, is where we have X predicting Y. I get asked a lot, does X have to predict Y originally? Um, no, because the idea is that X predicts M, predicts Y, kind of depends on how much you want to adhere to the original Baron and Kinney steps um, and what reviewer you get. So uh, the kind of feeling now is no, uh, but your indirect effect should be greater than zero. And we're almost there. So I can report this one by saying B equals now 1.5, negative 1.52, 53 if I round up. T again is back to 28 because we only have X in the equation and not also M. And that's negative 3.64 and that actually is significant. And then we would talk about our covariates one more time if you wanted to, or you could say we covaried them out and never talk about them again. I've seen that happen both ways. And so now we've got negative 3.39. So these two are comparable. This is with and without M. So you can kind of see how M is affecting these other ones. Now it's less than 0.001 looking right here. Gear actually flipped signs. So that's interesting. All right, so before it was positive and now it's negative. Okay, still not significant. So that's how I'd write all of those up. Now let's get into the actual did mediation happen part. 
Now, it's going to repeat the total effect on y, right? So this one is um, c for total effect. This one, direct effect, is c prime path. And they're pretty different, right? So it's dropping, it's halving when I add in m. But I don't, at the moment, know if that half is big enough to be considered mediation. And that having effect here is listed here. So it says HP out here because that's the effect of M, so the effect of adding in horsepower when I look at um, cylinders predicting miles per gallon. So this is kind of like how much that's changing. Okay. Now, here's where all the ad action happens. So if you want to report the indirect, I always just write indirect equals um, because I don't, there's not really like a symbol for indirects. Um, so you can just do like indirect equals. Uh, or you can say in, well, it's not really a B value, so I don't know if I'd stick B in front of it. So it's negative 0.72. I usually tend to also list the standard error. Okay. So that's that boot SE here, so 0 0.55. And then definitely also list the confidence interval. So 95% CI is, and this is where you get into negative 1.62. And, uh-oh, one's positive and one's negative. That's no good. Okay. And since that interval includes zero, that would indicate to us that this is no mediation because the CI includes zero. Okay. So um, even though the change between C and C prime or A times B um, is large, it's all, it clearly looks like a not zero number, there's a lot of standard error there, and so um, this does not indicate mediation because it includes zero in the confidence interval. Although some different um, effect sizes, uh, you'll have to look at Hayes' uh, stuff to tell you a little bit more about how these are calculated, and you'll notice it also does not give you the Sobel test anymore. If you're wanting the Sobel test, what you would do is go, uh, and you have SPSS, is that you can use Chris Preacher's website. Um, I don't know that the Sobel test is necessary. I find that it tends to agree with the confidence interval, but let's say you have a reviewer that um, just is in love with the Sobel test and you just need it. Um, on quantsci.org, there is a way to type it in and just kind of get it for easy peasy. Okay, so you would type in A and B, uh, the error for A and the error for B, and it'll give you all of them. I recommend this one. Okay. Or you can actually type in T for A and T for B and get the same answer. So let's plug that in. So let's go back up here and find A. So there's B. A was up here, so here's T for A, because it's probably the fastest way. T for B, here's, here's B. Go! And that would tell us that it is not significant. So as I've said, it tends to agree with the confidence interval. Okay. So all that together is how I would run a simple mediation model, so model four, with covariates in the, um, in the equation, and um, think about how to report those, like an APA style. And so in this example, we didn't find mediation. We're also super underpowered, so we also talked about power. And so mainly if you wanna keep uh, following this series, we're gonna walk through all these different examples. Um, hit subscribe to uh, save the channel and then we're going to try to post videos more frequently on uh, the different permutations of mediation and moderation models, especially focusing on categorical variables because the new version of the process does a lot of cool stuff with those. So thanks for watching and good luck with your mediation.